everyone and welcome to a new video. This week I thought it'd be really cool to go through my vintage cookbook collection. Initially I thought it would be a good idea to go through all my books and just kind of like give you a little taste of each one and then I realized how many cookbooks I have. Yeah. I have a lot. I absolutely love cooking, I love baking, I love discovering new recipes. It's very interesting to study how a lot of these recipes come full circle and how these trends are usually just that, they're trends. And just because they're new to us doesn't mean they're necessarily new. So I'm going to take you through some of my cookbooks and uh, like I said I have a lot so we're only going to do the 30s through the 50s. I have tons of cookbooks from the 60s, tons of cookbooks from the 70s, and quite a few from the 80s. And uh, that's that's just my cookbooks. That's not my mom's or either of my grandma's. Like they both have tons of cookbooks. So if you're interested in exploring history in this way with me, go ahead and let me know in the comments. I will go ahead and make some more videos on that. Why don't we go ahead and start looking at some cookbooks because that's why you're watching this video. I'm just gonna go ahead and put on my glasses because I can't really read too well without them. Okay, so I'm first gonna start you off with this General Foods cookbook. Uh, and you might look at this and be like, wow, this is a really old book. It doesn't even have the cover. Why do I want to look at it? Because of all those reasons, that's why I picked this up. This book I actually got from an antique store. I found it just laying around in the corner and I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta snatch this up. And when I opened it up, and I found out that this is actually from 1937. Now, uh, because it is the fifth edition, but originally this was copyrighted in 1932. That's so cool. And I think it's interesting just to look at like, that was their pantry. Like what? <laughs> I know it's um, all staged and it's not necessarily what the pantries look like, but just looking at the labels are incredibly interesting because there's some things we still have like swan's down cake flour, that's still a thing, uh, baker's coconut, that's still a thing, log cabin syrup, that doesn't come in a tin anymore. I really enjoyed reading the introduction to this cookbook because, like for one, it says, but why another cookbook? And I was like, this is from 1937. You have no idea how many cookbooks have been published since then. And also it talks about like, oh, if you have a busy day, here's some shorter recipes that don't take as long. So we just have an index, um, how to find different things. So say uh, you really, really just want a chocolate cake, you can open this up and go to cakes. And then you can go down to chocolate fudge cake. And it's great because it's cakes made in Egyptian. So you won't have to worry about like not having enough time to make the cake you want. Uh, so that's just the index. Then it kind of talks about general foods, why you should trust them, how to use this cookbook, what the different tools are used for, uh, what you should keep in your pantry, uh, what are the staples. Uh, a lot of this, of course, is Here's my brand, you should use it. Of course, some things like grape nuts are used a lot in here, and I have seen them once in the grocery store. So you could tell that it was very popular back then, but it's not really popular now. So it's kind of hard to find some of these ingredients. And of course the ingredients change as far as like quality and what goes into them. So the recipe you make naturally is not gonna be the same as if you made it 90 years ago. Okay, so doing the job the modern way, which is so cool because this is like, this is new and innovative and you're looking at this like, I have a machine that could do that for me. Or I could buy it already like pre-cut up and all that. So it's kind of cool to see how this was time saving back then, but it's not time saving anymore. And how cooking has evolved since then. Uh, another thing that I find really interesting was what the people ate and what their daily diet was. Uh, so this talks about an adequate diet and then it'll say um, what kind of minerals you should eat, uh, what the food groups are, which the food groups, oh my gosh, it's constantly changing, it's kind of annoying. But this one talks about different groups based on different minerals, which I find really interesting. So like basic group, group one, group two, uh, group three, group four, and group five, which is completely different from what we have now. This was. So it made it easier for you to meal plan uh, because uh, usually it, it was the wife 
who would be cooking the food and she'd have to take care of the children and the house. The children would be off at school and the father would be off at work. So it was the wife's job to plan this all out. And it's really cool because there's actually a meal planner in here. Uh, so yeah, this kind of goes over like, oh, if you want a chicken dinner for summer, we highly recommend you start out with a jellied tomato bouillon. And you have fried chicken, corn on the cob, spinach, currant jelly, baking powder, biscuits. And then for dessert, you have cantaloupe a la mode and dimitas. Dimitasi? I'm not sure. Whoa! Uh, that's really cool. And so, this doesn't necessarily mean everyone ate like this, you know, for a chicken dinner during the summer. But it's an example of what might have been eaten then and what was recommended by uh, general foods. So it's interesting just to see how they would make certain things and some things like cocoa syrup for iced drinks. I mean, you just use Hershey chocolate syrup, you just buy that instead of making it. But it probably this probably tastes really good. A lot of these recipes I haven't tried because I have no excuse. But I just haven't tried them. Um, some of these like bran muffins, uh, they want one cup of whole bran treads. Where do I get that at? Um, I just have to do some research and see what that ingredient is and where I can find it. Because the grocery stores are completely different from what they used to be. And you can see in the layout they would give you uh, the ingredients first. And they don't give you like step by step. This is just one entire paragraph where it will tell you, oh yeah, you should use this and this and this and this. And then you do this, 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 and this. Now, if I were to make a recipe from this book, I would most definitely read the ingredients I needed and then read the paragraph. Then I'd read the ingredients again, pull them all out, and then go back through the paragraph so I knew exactly what I was doing because it's not a step-by-step. -step. And then you go back to here and it tells you how to shop for foods. So like, uh, Sam getting ham. Ham is good for large families, picnics, parties, and weekends. Oh, okay. I absolutely love just reading this book, just as a, almost like a, a pleasure read, like I would read a novel. Just to learn a little bit about how people live almost 100 years ago. Okay, it's only 80 years, but uh, that's still quite a long time, and to see how food has evolved since then and the preparation of food and what people ate is incredibly interesting. I'm a history nerd. I love learning about history, so excuse me if I get very nerdy in this video. So this is my oldest cookbook that I own. So that's from 1937. And unfortunately, I don't have any cookbooks from the 40s, but I do have a few cookbooks from the 50s. I'm gonna start you off with the oldest out of the 50s. And uh, this is actually one of my newest, oldest books. Um, it's Betty Crocker's Picture Cookbook. And my parents got this for me a few years ago. So it's a new print but the edition comes from the 1950s. I mean, look how pretty this cookbook is. And it walks you through everything. So if you take the time to learn how to use this cookbook, it's actually really, really helpful. It tells you how to read the recipes, how to measure, um, what the different terms are, and then a dictionary. So sometimes I'm reading a cookbook or I'm watching a cooking show, and then they just say something and I'm like, I have, literally no idea what that means. So I can go into this dictionary and I'll be like, okay, so what does a la king mean? And it says right here, food served in rich cream sauce usually containing mushrooms, green pepper, pimento, often flavored with sherry. I wouldn't have known that from watching the cooking show or just saying, oh yeah, this is uh, shrimp a la king. I guess that would be a recipe. I'm not sure. That actually sounds really good. Different cooking tools and how you would use them, and then storing food. Very, very interesting. Uh, how to prepare different foods, how to cut different foods. So if it says like, we need this cubed, be like, oh, so that's what it is. And I love this cookbook because it has pictures. So you could really see, oh, this is how they did it. This is how I need to do it. Again, we're brought into the uh, nutrition guides from the 1950s. You can see that they still have the groups. We have pictures to go with those groups. And for the most part, they are the same. Along with the other one I just showed you, this one also goes through a meal plan so that you don't have to try and figure out how to, what to eat when and where and if I'm busy or if I have extra time and it's a Sunday and I want it to be a really nice meal. They kind of plan everything out for you. 
And with both of them, these are just examples so then you know how to put foods together and you can start doing it on your own after you have some practice. It's like with anything, you need a little bit of practice. It's, you know, meal planning is no exception. And then it talks about like meal plan. See, this is really cool. It says you should think about the appropriateness of it. So is it just a Tuesday night dinner? Or is it a party I'm throwing? Or um, is it gonna be a party for kids? Is it gonna be a party for grown-ups? Uh, so you gotta think about that. The appearance, <laughs> it, it, talks, it talks about this so much, where it says like, if the food looks good, they're probably gonna eat it. If it doesn't look good, they're probably not gonna eat it. It could be the exact same food, uh, which, uh, me, food is food. If it tastes good, if it doesn't, you know. I think it is important, a lot, most people, I mean, including me, we eat with our eyes first and then we decide at that moment whether or not we like it, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but yeah. You know. Third is satisfaction, like will I feel full after eating this? Uh, nutrition, like does this have the nutritional benefits that I need? And then cost, which is like, always, always just important, unless you just have, you can spend whatever money you have on food, that's my goal. Just to be able to buy whatever I want and just leave the grocery store and eat whatever I want. Be good. And then we go into like these different tabs. So you have appetizers, breads, cakes, cookies, salads, pies, vegetables, supper dishes, soups, sauces. And the layout of this is really different. So say we go to breads. It gives you the index, so everything that is in here. So if you know you definitely want bread, then you're like, oh wait, I need a quick bread then you can find it very easily in this book. And it'll give you little hints and tricks in the beginning. And then it shows you with pictures what those tips are and how to do them. So you read all the tricks and then you read the recipe. So when you make the recipe, it's a little bit easier on you. The first thing you're probably gonna notice is that this layout is different compared to the general foods one. The directions are mixed in with the ingredients. Now this is how my grandma wrote all her recipes. So instead of, you know, writing, you need eggs, bread, and milk. I guess that would be French toast. Um, but eggs, bread, and milk. And then it's like, you beat the eggs, you add the milk, you take the bread out, you dip it in there, and then you put it on the pan. You know, instead of wasting the time to divide it up, this kind of puts it all together. Where in that example, it would say, take two eggs, beat it, Take a quarter cup of milk, add it to the mixture, beat it again. Again, it's like you're reading a novel. So it's very different in this cookbook. One thing I really enjoy about this cookbook is that it talks about the importance of balance. Yes, this may seem like you want to make everything perfect, and you might want to, but it's also important to take a break and to take care of yourself and to just, you know, out, go out, enjoy nature, or read a book, or not worry about cooking and cleaning the entire time. I'm assuming this was in the original one. So that's Betty Crocker. And then we're gonna go over to the Sunbeam Mix Master, which is actually just a standing mixer. My grandma used this for everything and it the motor just went out like last year. And she's had it for years. This is mine. Uh, she has her own copy and it came with the mixer. And it's really cool because it not only goes over like how to use it and how to set it up. Um, and then there's also <laughs> really cool like old vintage advertisements in here. It has recipes that you can make with the mixer. So it's a manual, an advertisement, and a cookbook. And this was copyrighted in 1950, so the same time as the Betty Crocker book. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at what the layout is. It's the same setup as a Betty Crocker cookbook, so we can probably take a wild guess that this is just how recipes were written in the 1950s. Which makes sense because uh, a lot of my grandma's recipes she wrote down then are the layout it is on the index cards that she used. It's a lot like a kitchen aid where it has different attachments, different kind of bowls you can use. It tells you how to clean uh, different parts for the model that you have. And then just little tips on how to use them. And some of these recipes, like prune whip, I've never heard of prune whip before. But here it is, you know? So it's really cool to be able to compare the Sunbeam cookbook to the Betty Crocker cookbook because they're both 
printed in the same year. The last cookbook I'm going to go over in this video is The Good Housekeeper's Party Pie Book. So I found out this is a 1954... 1958 book. And I love picking up these old books because sometimes they have little notes written in them or they have like this one, it has a recipe clipped in. So you know that that recipe is good because someone else has already tried it. So this was someone else's book before I owned it. Again, with this one, it's an adorable book. When we take a look at some of the illustrations in here. And you can tell just by looking at this, it is the 1950s. And it's great because this one has pictures that come with it. So if you want your pie to look a certain way, It'll give you step-by-step -step pictures, which I think is really important, uh, especially for me since I'm a visual learner. Like, you could write it all out and I could picture it in my mind, but what my picture is in my mind and what, what the author is intending for the end result to look like is completely different. So the pictures kind of erases that confusion. So this fresh apple pie must have been really good, with some exceptions. Uh, the previous owner wrote little uh, notes on the on the side so that they would remember how to make the apple pie really good in the future. So it must have been a good book. Someone used it a lot. And the colored illustrations are always just so much fun. In general, I just read through <laughs> cookbooks in my spare time because it's just really relaxing and it helps me be more creative and thinking about what I want to cook or bake in the future. It's just a lot of fun to go through these old books and then kind of incorporate old techniques with new techniques and then come up with something that's new, even though most new things aren't really new, they're just old and then brought, brought back. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to go through some recipes or if you have some recipe ideas for me to try, I can make another video for that. I have so many more cookbooks. These are just the oldest cookbooks that I have and I'm so happy I didn't go through all my cookbooks because we would be here for hours. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I hope you're taking care. I know there's a lot of crazy things going on. So if you need to just escape and do something for yourself, maybe get into the kitchen and make yourself a nice meal or bake your favorite cookies or um, try a new recipe that you never had before because the kitchen never fails to make me feel better after I'm done. I will see you guys next week and until then, take care. All right, bye.